have a lot of close friends who are my age and, you know, in their thirties. And they're always asking me how I found mentors and who do I turn to for advice? And how did I learn some of the stuff that I apply in my work? And I always point to the show and I just wish it's like an experience that everyone could have, that they could have hosted with Emily and the Amy's and Sarah. Yeah. Every episode is like a little bit of mentorship. Yeah. I'm just grateful that this experience brought all of us together. Yeah, I can't believe it's been this long since we decided to have a host reunion episode. Yeah. It is funny because actually I do listen to the episodes that you guys have been producing post my departure. And um, it's sort of like spying on friends. I'm like, (laughs) what are the Amy's up to today? But of course, it's very one sided. So I haven't actually gotten a chance to like hear directly from you or, you know, ask you questions or whatever. But I enjoy getting the updates and hearing all the questions you guys ask the experts you have on. And I loved the last season you guys put out that we're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to talk about it. Yeah, you know, and it, it is rare, I think, to have the work experience to have a safe space to talk about these things with people who are at different points in their life and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. points in their career. And it's funny that we do it with a microphone in front of our face because you would think that would put us on edge. But this is one of the safest spaces. Well, I no have. one's listening, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Women at Work from Harvard Business Review. I'm Amy Bernstein. I'm Nicole Torres. I'm Emily Caulfield. I'm Sarah Green Carmichael. And I'm Amy Gallo. And we're winding down season eight with a host reunion. Sarah, Emily, and Nicole are here to reflect on the issues we've covered this season and to tell us how they've been doing. All right, let's start with life updates. Emily, what's new with you? Well, I am trying to learn how to be a business owner. Mm. Sometimes (laughs) feeling successful, sometimes failing. But I've been doing, since I left HBR, I've been doing vintage markets once or twice a week. Mm. And getting by that way, not saving a lot of money, Mm -hmm. but it's been fun. It's been like a totally different world. So, yeah, I'm enjoying it, but also struggling through it and trying to figure out how to do this well. Mm -hmm. That's awesome because our goodbye episode, you were like, I don't know how long I'll be able to do this. It's been six months. So at least six months. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Nicole, what's going on with you? Well, since leaving HBR, I have been focused on building a life in London. So I've been here a little over two years, and I recently became deputy editor of my team, Bloomberg Opinion Europe. So that has kept me pretty busy. Work has been very full on. Congrats on the promo. That's amazing. I called it a little promomo. Yes, that also (laughs) means we've gone from me being Nicole's boss when she was at HBR to now her being higher on me <laughs> on the masthead. <laughs> I was going to say superior to me, but she was always superior to Aww. me. So now she's also higher on the masthead, which is what she deserves. Um, yes, I have changed jobs twice since leaving HBR. And last time I was on this podcast, I was briefly at Barron's where I was the ideas editor. And then I've now been at Bloomberg Opinion for about three years. So, yeah. And I had a baby during the pandemic. So that's also been a big life change. Minor, yeah. minor update. I know, there. just a minor <laughs> update. Two job changes and a baby. (laughs) So, Sarah, was there any episode in particular that caught your attention? I mean, many. I think given my life stage, um, the supportive spouse one really hit me in a different way than the last time Mm -hmm. we dealt with that topic. So last time we talked about that with Jen Patriglieri, I did not have a child. (laughs) And now I do. And that, of course, changes a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, So there was so much in that episode that I I actually like was taking notes on my phone. (laughs) But I think one thing that really struck me was how much these arguments feel like an interpersonal argument, but they are, in fact, shaped by so much around us. Mm. Um, She specifically had talked about, I think, the challenge of nursing early on and that establishing a pattern in the relationship where because she was the one physically feeding the child, there was sort of less for her husband to do and how that might sort of set them off on an unbalanced course, you know, from the very beginning. And I have heard that from so many other women, and they're just following the recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, But actually, in in my own situation, I'm sort of grateful that breastfeeding really just bombed and just Mm. did not work out. And at the time, that was really upsetting to Mm -hmm. me. But now I'm like, actually, by switching to formula really early, my husband was able to be involved in a way that he just... I think would not have been had my grand plans worked out. So I I don't know. There was so much there to dig into. But really, the thing that struck me was like we are just shaped by things like how long our parental leave is versus our partners. 
the American Academy of Pediatrics, like so many external and societal forces beyond just the relationship. And then the relationship has to carry all the weight of yes. all of that external stuff. Mm -hmm. That's such a good way to put it. And I think we were sort of hinting around that with Becky, just that the expectations of society, family, our employers, our colleagues, like how the relationship is just burdened by that. And then it's putting so much pressure on these two people to navigate all of these biased systems. Mm -hmm. And one thing that hit me in the course of that conversation was how marriage is this constant negotiation, right? Yeah. And I wonder if you found that as well, Sarah. Yes. I think that what has really helped us during this phase of life is to focus on what we need from each other and not mm -hmm. so much on what's fair. Because anytime you're in a fairness conversation, it's now kind of a tug of war, like mm -hmm. a zero-sum game almost. But if you're just saying, look, what I really need from you tonight is you put the baby to bed and I just put my feet up because I'm just done. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. what I really need from you this week is to you take care of the baby all by yourself so I can go speak at a conference. <laughs> you know, my, that's something I just did. My husband had our daughter for nine days by himself. And, you know, it's also by focusing on needs, not fairness. I think, you know, I don't know if I could be a solo parent with as much aplomb as my husband just did for nine days. Mm -hmm. Like I've done it. Like he got COVID and I had to be like super mom for 11 days and it was awful yeah. um and so i actually think sometimes we can ask things of our partner that we cannot quite give back to them yeah so that's why i, I feel like making that shift to focus on needs and not sort of 50 50 what's 100 percent fair mm -hmm. has really helped us it's never 50 50 it's right never no. no it's always 90 10 <laughs> <laughs> in one way or the other oh, right yeah, yeah. One oh, day to day and day to day it might you know change or hour to hour so right yeah one thing that stuck out to me was how or something that i found that makes so much sense and is very obvious but just hearing it was really reassuring you have to have these big picture conversations important conversations with your partner about values and priorities regularly, or if not regularly, mm -hmm. at least periodically, because values and priorities change when you get promoted, when you get a different job, when you have a baby. So like as life changes, things in your own relationship will change. And like I am partnered. And so we've had a few conversations about big life goals and values and how we want our independent lives to go alongside each other and merge. And it's helpful to know that those won't be the last conversations we have. We will have to keep having them as things change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Nicole, was there a particular episode that caught your attention? Like Sarah, I have notes on, on each one, but I guess the one that is most relevant to my life currently was the ups and downs of first time managers. It's something I've been thinking about because my work has gotten a bit more managerial in nature. So the thing I really took away was that you don't need to have all the answers. In fact, you shouldn't go into a team trying to show that you have all the answers. You just need to be asking questions and trying to figure out what you don't know and trying to show up and learn from people around you. So that's something that I've been trying to do in my role. But I I think what also helped in, you know, building trust with my team and winning their respect was not just focusing on learning, but also showing that I was hearing what they were saying and try to incorporate that into my work. So one, one thing I found useful is to ask my writers what they think makes a great editor. Mm. And they will all give me very different responses, you know, from like, just email me back when I send you a pitch or, you know, be decisive. Um, things like that, but all kind of generally different for each person. And then when working with them each time after, I will like make a point to demonstrate that I did hear them. Like I'll get back to them faster or I'll try to be more decisive. I love that. So that was something that I thought about while listening. So simple. And any manager could do that. Yeah. What do you mm -hmm. think makes a great boss? Yeah, exactly. Right. And honestly, just listening to that episode, Amy B. had an answer for everything. So like, true. you had an answer for everything. For and everything. I, yes. <laughs> oh, God. Every scenario that came up, you had just, like, such a good response. Like, I know you do your job as, like, an editor and all the other jobs that you do, but being a manager is, like, a totally different skill set, and you yeah. have those skills, and you knew exactly how to respond to everything they could bring up. 
And well, it helps to have made every mistake in the book. <laughs> so I guess that's how you learn. But yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's reassuring that you can learn that skill. Yes. Yeah. And I agree that it's a skill. I think we often treat it as like, especially in first time managers, I think they step in and think, well, why don't I know all this? Right. You know, mm-hmm. like I well, should who's, know who's born a manager. I mean, what child says, golly, I hope I grow up to be an editor and a manager. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's right. I found myself in that episode really remembering the research you mentioned by Daniela Loop mm-hmm. that said that women tend to not experience greater job satisfaction when they become a manager, but men do. Mm -hmm. And you talked about some possible reasons why that might be the case. And I wondered how much it has to do with role conflict. Because like Mm. when I was a first time manager, I really felt that it was sort of was like, I've been raised to be likable, to be a pleaser, to do what people ask of me. And now I'm in this role where I'm like sort of also trying to be an authority and like boss people around and not please them. And that was just so much internal Mm -hmm. conflict that it was challenging. Yeah. I think one of the hardest things for me though, and I'm curious how you all have dealt with this in experiences managing. So for me and some of the women in the episode brought it up, they really had a hard time with delegating or like relinquishing Mm -hmm. control, which I think is a big issue when you go from being an individual contributor to then like being in charge of people And I do struggle with that. Like something I found Mm -hmm. is in the past, I would always kind of reach for or try to take up the coolest, most exciting projects. But now, like I still want to do that. But part of the job also, it seems like I have to make sure other people are getting to do that work. Mm -hmm. And I have a really hard time letting go. And I don't know (laughs) if I'm doing a bad job, but I feel like that's something that a good manager does is they step back and let other people have opportunities. But that is a, a learnable thing. Well, a lot of this learning is lear- is learning to give up some stuff, yeah. you know, and it's learning yeah. to, um, it's learning what really matters. And when you become a manager, part of your job is helping other people to shine. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you get marked on that. Yeah. And it's also yeah. where you should find joy, right? Yeah. I'm just going to make a plug here for, we have done an Essentials episode last spring on delegation. So, you can all listen to it right after mm. this if you'd yeah. like. But it is, the, for me, it was the hardest thing. It took me years to learn to do that. What about you, Sarah? Yeah, I think for me, partly what was helpful was reframing it from like, I'm dumping this work I don't have mm-hmm. time for on someone else mm-hmm. to I'm actually giving up the parts of the job that in some ways I enjoy the most so that other people have an opportunity yes. to do them and yeah. to learn them. And I think what then became hard was like, how do I right size the delegation to the person's skill level Mm -hmm. so that I'm not just saying, okay, sink or swim, have fun, Mm -hmm. right? This is a great project. I wish I were doing it, (laughs) you know? But then it's sort of like, yeah, you sort of have to customize that to the person you're delegating to. Mm. This weekend, I'm actually, so I want to do as many markets as possible because I have to make money. Mm -hmm. So this weekend on Saturday, there's a market. I wanted to do it, but I can't because I have to be somewhere else. And I physically need to be in the place to sell the clothes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hire somebody. And this will be my first time having somebody work on their own. And I'm so scared. Mm. I'm so scared because I do like that part of the job where I get to, like, interact with customers and help people style things and try things on. And this person seems great. I think she's going to do a great job. I'm still worried about it. But I think the benefit of this is it's, like, kicking me into gear to be like, I have to make sure that I'm setting her up for success. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's not the same as having like a full blown career or like a full time job, but it's hugely important to your business. Yeah. Though. Yeah. There's like something about this little opportunity that I'm like, oh, this makes me feel like. But it's a huge opportunity because it helps you scale. Yes. Mm-hmm. I have no business scaling at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you're not the best judge of that. <laughs> But you do because you have somewhere else to be. Like, yeah. That's the, yeah. like, that's the reality. I think the market's telling you you need to scale. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, can we talk about retirement? Yes. Oh, yes. God, that again. <laughs> <laughs> you, Let's you, please you, talk, talk about retirement. That made us most uncomfortable. Oh, I, I think I spent a full week getting over that episode. <laughs> I have to say, it was so funny to me to like, I don't, I'm not sure funny, haha, funny, weird, or just, I don't know. But it was so remarkable to me to listen to you guys sort of painfully talk about retirement. That is clearly something you, 
Meanwhile, I'm over here like dreaming of my retirement and building castles in the sky. Oh, thinking yeah. about all the things I'm going to say do. when it's decades away. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, fair point. Yeah. I was like, it's way too soon for me to be so excited about retirement. Right. But anyway, Did I love that episode. Did you pick up any tips? Yes. The three questions oh, um, yeah. that came up of what do you want? Why do you want it? And how are you going to get it? I felt like that was super helpful, whatever life stage you're at yeah. or career stage. Yeah. yeah. Funny enough, retirement has been like a fairly common topic since I've moved to London. And it's not mm. one that just like my friends' parents are talking about um, and colleagues are talking about. It's something that like my friends and my peers have been talking about too. And I never thought I would get to retire. Like it's just not something I've ever thought I would ever be able to financially achieve or like I wouldn't have enough in my life to be able to fill the time that I spend working. But since moving abroad, like it is something that I think about now. And I don't know if that's because it's just like more built in in the UK. I know it is in Europe, that there are just systems and it's sort of expected that you will get to retire at a decent point in your life and have a nice life that does not revolve around your job. So that's been a big change for me around retirement. And then hearing this, I was like, oh, now I can actually start thinking about it practically. Yeah. I think there's probably less of a hustle culture too, which like the, I'll never retire as sort of a, you know, badge of honor. It does seem like in another culture that sort of I'll never retire might seem pathological, not, <laughs> yeah, not admirable. Yes. I, it's a weird machismo, yeah. actually. It's like busyness, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, you know, what scares me is it as having it foist upon me rather than choosing yeah. it. I, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I spent days after we recorded that thinking about what was making me so uncomfortable about yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and you know, Amy, 50 percent of retirees in America don't retire by choice. Yeah. Um, so one, well, I didn't know that number, yeah. but thanks for putting. Sorry, that. but yeah, half she just people. pulled that stat out of nowhere. No, I know <laughs> that's the Sarah Green karma we all love. Well, it has to do with a lot of your financial situation mm-hmm, too, because yeah. like you might have a plan to retire at seventy or seventy-five, and then suddenly you have a health issue at sixty-eight. Yeah, so it's a huge problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just wanting to maintain my sovereignty over myself. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that becomes. You know, when you're in your 30s or your 40s, it's salient, but it's very real for me in my early 60s. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it happen to a lot of people. It's happened to my friends who were suddenly retiring when I knew that was not in their plans. So maintaining the control over my future is important. Yeah. Well, and the word that I don't think it came up in the episode, but like your integrity like, I think we want to make all of our career decisions with maintaining our integrity, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Which is mm-hmm. an element of control, but is also about, am I doing this in the way that I want to do it and that aligns with my values? I mean, I think that's ultimately what Anne's three questions were yeah. about. It's like, mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. I do this in a way that I feel good about? And that's not as strongly influenced by outside forces. And we need to recognize that even the ability to ask yourself those questions is a privilege. Yes, mm-hmm. that's right. I think of the five of us, I'm the I'm currently the most retired mm-hmm. of all of us. <laughs> like I feel like I You re- think being an entrepreneur is retired? <laughs> I I'm not the best entrepreneur. I could be working forty hours a week on this business and I'm kinda like, how do I spend my time? And listening to this episode The two women that you spoke to, Audrey and Donna, they had their shit together like so well. They both had a plan before they retired. Donna looked at a clock. Did she like (laughs) down to the minute she planned her life out? They both had several things that they were doing. Donna, she said that she was six months out from leaving her job. And I was like, oh, my God, that resonates with me so much. I'm six months out from leaving my full time job. Mm. And She's like, I'm in the best shape ever and this and that. And I want to get to that point, too. And I'm thinking like, oh, I should have left this job with more of a plan of how I'm going to spend my days. So when I retire for real, I will do that. (laughs) And right now that I'm at the six month mark, I'm feeling like I need to have more structure around it. Yeah. Um, I took up a part time job at a yoga studio Mm. because I'm like, I need to fill my time more. I have to feel more productive. I have to do more. And I also wanted a free membership <laughs> so I could exercise because that's, but that's I need smart. to do that. Smart. That's so, smart. Yeah. But I think financially most... in a bad position. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad you pointed that out about Donna and Audrey because I think most people probably don't go in 
And, and Audrey didn't have as much of a plan yeah. as Donna because she didn't have the external support that Donna had brought in. Mm-hmm. But I do think most people go into retirement a little bit like, well, let's see how this goes. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And and I think they all, both Donna and Audrey and Anne, all made a very strong argument for being more planful yeah. Yeah. about it. And a lot of people unretire. Like retirement yes. contains so much. You know, yeah. my parents are partly retired, but they are busier than ever somehow. Yes. So it's easy to fill up that time if you're the kind of person who is like engaged and interested and yeah. mm-hmm. just fills your day with stuff. Yeah. Yeah. My mom said she was going to read books for two years after retirement and then she'll (laughs) figure out. But like within six months, she's on like the housing board in her town and helping to like advocate for, you know, affordable housing. And you're like, oh, okay, I see how this is going to go. Exactly. When I sort of see what actual retirement is like, it actually looks very busy. (laughs) Right. Right. I don't think retirement is being idle. I think retirement is a a change in your direction. And just living all kinds of lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Retirement, colon, living all kinds of lives. Like, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> here, here. I'm ready. What I no, would, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> what I would love to see from corporate America on that front is like making part time work more viable for more people. Right. Yeah. Because I think there's demand at all phases of life. But I think I especially see it in some colleagues who are approaching retirement and they just don't want to put in 40 or 50 hours mm-hmm. a week. I had some colleagues I worked with at Bloomberg who actually alternated months. So one of them would work September and then the next one would come in and take over that same set of tasks for October, you know, and then they would flip back. And for them, for a long time, for years, it worked, seemed to work really, really well. Right. And I think that, you know, whether it's something like that or whether it's working 20 hours a week, I just don't think that most companies are set up to no. accept that. But right. there's such a huge market out there of skilled people who would really like to work that way. And yeah. those there is a market of those people. And their skills and experience are invaluable, mm-hmm. right? And there, we have a labor mm-hmm. shortage, if you haven't noticed. And we noticed. have a labor mm-hmm. shortage, you know? right? Yeah. This seems like a good time to segue into one of the other episodes that really caught my attention, yeah. which was the most recent one on leading organizational change. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, Sarah, we had you firmly in mind when we were planning that episode because before you had Georgia, you fought the good fight for parental leave here. And I think that might be one of the reasons you left. Um, yeah. Were you pregnant at the time? I was fighting not. The fight? okay. No, I was displeased and em- frankly embarrassed by our parental leave policy at the time. HBR had one week of paid parental leave for all new parents. Yeah. And then um, if you were the birth parent, you could take seven additional weeks of short term disability. And then the seven weeks were partially paid if you were an employee for fewer than seven years and fully paid if you had been an employee for more than seven years, which Mm. was under a Harvard University policy. And actually, universities universally have terrible, it turns out, parental leave policies, including, you know, a lot of the other universities in the Boston area. I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll build a case for this by looking at those and they'll have better policies and we'll be they'll be shamed into changing the Harvard <laughs> policy. And it was like, nope, actually, they're all really bad. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I was not pleased by that. I didn't think it was enough time. And I just thought, like, we need to change this. Mm-hmm. And I thought at the time. To the extent that I have any political capital at this organization from the work I've put in for the last 11 plus years, I'm going to cash in every chip on this fight. Mm -hmm. And I think listening to that episode, I felt like there were definitely some things I could have done better (laughs) in in pushing for the change. Like Like what? Well, like Amy G, like you talk about how you're a spreadsheet person, Mm -hmm. guilty, also a spreadsheet person. And I'm like, behold my beautiful spreadsheet and just change. Because what I did end up doing was I ended up finding other media organizations. And we were behind if you looked at other media organizations in terms of our leave offering. And I, I sort of thought that the data would just speak for itself. Yeah, I'm not sure I did enough to build a sort of coalition at the senior levels. I could have done more sort of, I think, to build a coalition among other employees. But I also didn't want to like start a petition because I was like, I don't want to be a, seen as a rabble rouser mm-hmm. and I don't want to ask mm-hmm. other people to stick their <laughs> neck out. Yeah. I, know, I might have failed and been seen as a rabble rouser anyway. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I think that like I could have definitely approached that more skillfully. In the end, the policy did change mm-hmm. and it is a better policy now. Mm-hmm. But that point about being seen as a rabble rouser, I don't think we covered that enough in the episode, which is that 
you're expending social capital, but you are also changing your reputation, either for positive or negative, while you're pushing for that change. And you have to be aware of that. And also why you'd build a broader coalition. So yeah. you're not the only one carrying that reputational cost, if there is a cost as opposed to a boost. I also felt a little bit at the time like, I can take this hit. I'm mm. not going to ask other women who might not have as much political capital mm-hmm. to spend it on this. Oh, like, that's interesting. I yeah. will take this hit if it's a hit. One thing that I always wanted to tackle in all my full-time jobs was um, pay transparency. Yeah, I wanted to talk about my pay with my coworkers, and I wanted my coworkers to talk about pay with me. And I never knew how to do that, but, like, I had this idea. I was like, I kind of want to add my salary to my email signature. Wow. And I want everybody else to do it, too. Mm. (laughs) But, of course, that opens up a big can of worms. But pay transparency was always one of those things that I'm like, why are we so secretive in all of the jobs that I've ever been in? Why are we so secretive about how much money we make? But... I realize that not everybody feels that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think each of us are probably more comfortable on some issues than others. Like, I will carry the flag anytime for parental leave. And then you start talking about money. I'm like, money is awkward. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I I know. Money is so awkward for all of us to talk about. I feel like I see the women at work, like, newsletters. It's called How I Got That Raise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, my God. Like, the numbers are right there. And I'm like, damn, these ladies are making a lot of money. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We can't not talk about the body size episode. Oh, yeah. man. The stats in the opening about the pay gap between quote-unquote normal size women versus women who live in larger bodies. It was so eye-opening to me and so depressing that the stigma is so deep. I will never look at office cake the same way. Just some of those examples of like the comments that you hear in meetings when there is, you know, an office snack or some celebration, like there's cake and people are aware of who reaches for the cake and who doesn't. That act can signal so many things and make people go into these shame spirals. Hearing that story kind of stunned me because we're in situations like that pretty constantly. Like there's always food around. There's always talk Mm -hmm. about office lunches and snacks and exercising. And there's always like this little valence of, you know, morality attached to that. Yeah. Emily and I just had this moment just now where I brought cookies. I'm like, do you want a cookie? She's like, no. I'm like, are you sure? And she's like, I think this should be this in is, body size. This is very relevant to the body size episode. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, and you just don't even realize. No, but I do want a cookie. Okay. I just need to have it after we're yeah. done here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and the comfort we have on commenting on other people's bodies, mm-hmm. particularly women's yeah. and their eating habits. Yes. It's so intense. I think before I listened to that episode, I would have said like, no, of course, like I don't have any weight bias or body size bias. But then when Habiba was talking about going through the self-assessment and coming back that she was biased in this way um, or exhibited some implicit bias, I thought like, yeah, I, I do too. The way I talk to myself when I'm a few pounds heavier or a few pounds lighter, like I'm not nice as nice to myself when I've gained a few pounds. Right. And I'm so congratulatory if I've lost weight, even if it was through not doing anything of my own, through not or like, exercising or like... Or just being sick. Yeah. I mean, that is, that's like, the wow. sickest thing to me is like yeah. the way we congratulate ourselves for losing weight because we were sick. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my oh. God. It's so like... I recently came through a very stressful period and I dropped like 12 pounds. And who was in her closet trying on (laughs) the clothes from the back of the rod and feeling pretty proud of herself? Thank God all those horrible things happened in my life. I now I fit in these pants. I mean, at least there's this, right? I know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's just so upsetting. Yeah. I feel like this is something that I've wrestled with a lot in the past couple of years, both because when I was trying to get pregnant, Mm -hmm. I ended up going on a crazy diet to help anyway whatever i went on a crazy diet where i cut out a lot of toxic foods quote unquote (laughs) lost 12 pounds and then got pregnant and then gained 45 pounds and then that took a long time to come off so my weight has been all over the place and yes the voices in your head Mm -hmm. that are talking to you are not your voice but there is some voice that you learned Mm -hmm. you know along the way and now i have a daughter and of course i'm like well i don't want her to hear this Yep. toxic language from me. Yeah. So even if some of those voices still talk to me, I'm sort of like, what can I exhibit in front of my child so that right. she maybe grows up with less of this? Because I don't 
think in our society we can totally block no, her out. No, you can't. But there's, but, you know, yeah. the whole body positivity movement. Or I think it's been huge. Body mm-hmm. neutrality well, is something that, be that nice has been get... helpful for me. Like I have just like if body positivity is for me a bridge too far right now, mm-hmm. we can just be neutral. These yeah. are my legs. Yeah, there they are. You mm-hmm. know, and that's been something that's just been helpful for me in terms yeah. of like I don't have to love them. They're just there. They get well, me where I need to go. Self acceptance <laughs> all the way around. I, yeah. It's helped me too. It's yeah. just you know there are certain things that just aren't going to change. Apparently, my legs are never going to be <laughs> long and lean. That's okay. Yeah. But one other thing that I liked about the bodies episode too is the importance of having basically just generating more awareness about this because we can have all of the self acceptance, you know, in the world, but that will be hard to achieve and hard to maintain if you go into workplaces and people are still like weirdly judging you and making comments about bodies. Mm -hmm. So there were some interventions in the episode that I thought were really good. One just stood out to me where when you're reaching for that piece of cake, just like cheers and like nothing, no comments on what that food means or what eating it symbolizes because it shouldn't symbolize anything. And I think more like tiny little gestures like that can go a long way. Like neutralizing should be a communal goal, not just something like we individually are seeking to do when it comes to accepting our bodies. So as you all might remember, just as soon as the season closes, you start thinking about the next one. So we're already planning for our next season and have a few topics we're thinking about, particularly how divorce affects women at work, Mm. whether or not you need a personal brand. What does that mean? How do you build it? And I'm curious from Emily, Sarah, Nicole, what you would like to hear us talk about. Sarah? I have been writing a list. Oh, go uh, ahead. <laughs> Send me did, one. Did she Can say you... she likes spreadsheets? Just type it up and email it. Type it up. Um, so you guys have talked about health issues on the show before, and you actually had a great episode this season about working while having a child who's going through mental health issues. I just feel like I'm in a phase of life where more and more friends are either having health issues themselves. A friend of mine had breast cancer earlier this year, and that was really hard on her family. And then... She's okay. She made it. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was really hard. And then we have uh, some other friends whose spouses have been diagnosed with devastating and very sudden forms of cancer. And like Mm -hmm. they they were a two parent family working family. And now they're just a single parent working family because their spouse was gone like very quick. Mm -hmm. So to me, the health issues are very salient. And I would love to hear you guys talk more about about managing that. Mm. Um, in addition, I have two other topics. Um, <laughs> one is schedule scheduling and rigidity and flexibility. Like, I think this is such a big issue for so many women, especially women who are not part of the quote unquote laptop class who can mm. zoom in. It's like, mm-hmm. if you have to be at your job and you have no flexibility, like, how does that work? Especially if you're like, don't find out until Tuesday that you're working on Wednesday. Right. That's is something I've been thinking a lot about. And then, you know, you mentioned personal brand. And I feel like we're living through such a time of social media transition now where, like, these platforms are sort of either plateauing or they're starting to disintegrate or they've been shown to create mental health problems in people yeah. who use them. And I feel like so much of a personal brand is being on social. Yeah. And so I am very curious to know if you guys have thoughts on kind of when you have to be on social media for your job, but you really don't want to be. It's not good for you. Right. Um, well, how do you manage that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nicole, what do you want us to cover? Well, as soon as you said personal branding, I thought of something very different. And that might mm. just be like time in my life and what my closest friends are talking about, which is women change their names and that affects your personal brand. And how do you handle that decision? I'm like having a lot of these conversations now with friends who are getting wed and some are changing their names, some are not. And we always have very interesting discussions about Mm. why or why not and how that affects their professional lives. So that is also a big part of branding that women have to consider. Mm -hmm. Separately, selfishly, I'm also interested in Hearing from other women who are, you know, thinking about children, Mm. just the decision to become a parent um, when your life has been so structured on your work. Basically, how do you how do you make that decision if it's a decision that you make at all? I don't know. Yeah. But Mm. that weighs on me. And I could imagine you all would treat that subject very gracefully and insightfully. Mm. You guys, I really want to be back for some of these episodes. (laughs) We we might have to have you back. Emily. 
I would, of course, love to hear more about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I want to know how women who have their own businesses are like planning out their days and their weeks and their months and their years and how they're making it work for them. Whether it's we've talked about this before. I'm very extrinsically motivated. Mm -hmm. And so having this one employee for one day is like. So helpful for me. <laughs> um, but like anything like that. So I'm I'm wondering how other women who are kind of doing it on their own are making it work because mm-hmm. I could use that advice myself. Right. Mm. I also really found that organizational change episode very interesting. And I want to hear more examples of people doing that within their organizations. Like I want to hear how people did it, what they wanted to change, what steps they went through to do it. Like more of those like very tangible examples will be so exciting. Yeah, I think we've talked about how that episode could have been like four episodes. I do think a case study would be so helpful to others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are all such good episodes. It makes me miss being on a team with you all so regularly Mm because these are these are wonderful ideas. And I'm sure we're going to pick up on a few of them for next season. Emily, Sarah, Nicole, this has been a joy, truly. Thank you so so much. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, so good to so see you guys. Good to have you guys back. As you know, at the end of every season of the show, we like to leave our listeners with some additional reading, listening, and a sense of when you'll be hearing from us again. So help me do that. Nicole, why don't, why don't you start? So I'm going to tell everyone to subscribe to the Women at Work newsletter, which Amanda Kersey, um, our producer, writes. It's twice a month. It's free, and you get resources, practical advice, personal stories to lift you up and move you forward. I think that's the tagline. Um, But beyond that, it's just like a really fantastic resource for what Women at Work is up to, what HBR is covering in terms of gender. Um, I love it because I get little snippets into Amanda's life. I learn a lot from that newsletter every time and I look forward to it. So plug that for everyone else. (laughs) That was such a nice little plug. Yeah. I highly recommend also the HBR Women at Work book series. There are three new books and they're being released on December 13th. They're available now for pre-order, Thriving in a Male-Dominated Workplace, Next Level Negotiating, and Taking Charge of Your Career. I'm really excited to read these. Also, until we meet again, there is the archive of episodes. I will say some of them I have listened to before, but they sound really different when you are, for example, suddenly a working mom. All those Working Parenthood episodes suddenly just hit my ear differently Mm -hmm. when I'm on the other side of it. So depending on where you are in your career, it can be worth going back and taking a listen. Then on January 9th, we'll return with another four episodes of The Essentials, which is our skill building series. Each episode, we go deep on a particular skill and we talk with a subject matter expert like a researcher and a woman working in a particular industry like, say, aerospace And together we talk through the principles and mechanics of whatever skill we're covering and how they apply on the ground, on the job, what they really look and sound like. So right, actually right before this recording, we had a meeting to discuss what topics we're going to cover in those episodes. And we're talking about skills like office politics, decision making, the very sexy topic of project management. Which I'll take. Yes. Amy was very excited about <laughs> project management. I was very excited about and that. And soliciting feedback, receiving feedback, being on the other end of that conversation. Those are such good topics. I can't wait to listen. Thank you. Women at Work's editorial and production team is Amanda Kersey, Maureen Hoke, Tina Toby Mack, Rob Eckhart, Erica Truxler, Ian Fox, and Hannah Bates. Robin Moore composed the scene music. And remember, Women at Work isn't the only podcast from Harvard Business Review. For starters, there's the HBR IdeaCast, yeah. which I used to host and hosted for about 10 years. It's a weekly interview show with leaders in business and management. I really miss hosting it. You interviewed um, me on that show. Yeah, I miss it's that. still a good show. <laughs> it's a Even without show. me, you should still listen to it. I miss it. Finally, if you've ever wondered how to sustain women at work, subscribing to Harvard Business Review really is the best way. A subscription gets you unlimited online access to digital articles, editor-curated reading lists, the weekly insider newsletter, and charts you can use in presentations. The print and premium plans offer all those benefits and then some. You can decide which plan is for you by going to hbr.org slash subscriptions. Thank you so much for your support.
All right, we gotta say goodbye. As sad as it is. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. That was a sad bye. bye. It was a bye. Okay. Bye. 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 This was so fun. Bye. Ta-ta. Bye. <laughs> Silly. This was so much fun. I know. This was fun. So fun. We should I miss you guys. We should reunite every single episode. 